Hello, friend. Welcome to the Whole Word Podcast. This is Pastor Pitts Evans. On this podcast, we read and discuss one chapter of God's Word per episode. Let's go now to the Bible and see what the Lord has for us today. 1 Timothy chapter 6. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters should not show them disrespect just because they are fellow believers. Instead, they should serve them even better because their masters are dear to them as fellow believers and are devoted to the welfare of their slaves. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession— I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care." Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in so doing have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. There's a great deal in this chapter about wealth. Now, I'm speaking to you from the Washington, D.C. regional area. This area is one of the wealthiest in the United States. In fact, um, the metro D.C. region is number one in wealth in the USA. We have nine counties around Washington, D.C., including counties in Virginia and Maryland, that have household incomes of over $100,000. The number one and number two wealthiest counties in America are Loudoun County and Fairfax County. I'm actually speaking from Fairfax County today. And so we have all this wealth all around us. And Paul has some some words for those uh, that have wealth. In verse 6, he writes, godliness with contentment is great gain. And so our wealth is not what brings contentment. It's godliness. Godliness is what we're seeking. Godliness is what we're preaching. Godliness is what we want. And the wealth of this world, I understand you have to have money to pay your bills, but this life is not about the accumulation of wealth. Paul writes in verse 7, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Someone once um, said that nobody sees a U-Haul behind a hearse. And so this idea of we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it is is true. Uh, There's no provision among Uh, human beings to take things into the next life, except for those things we've done for the Lord Jesus. And so if we have food and clothing, 
in this life and um, have the ability to care for ourselves and pay our bills, as I said, that should be satisfactory. We're not trying to get rich. Paul writes in verse 9, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people to ruin and destruction. Now, I want to just step aside from the text for a moment. I really believe that God has plans for some people to become wealthy. The problem is not with wealth. The problem is our attitude toward wealth. And so there are plenty of very godly people that have a significant amount of money. The money is not the issue. The motivation of the heart is the issue. And so are you driven by greed or are you driven by a a desire to please the Lord? Worded a different way, are you being led by your personal desires? Are you being led by the Holy Spirit? Inasmuch as you're led by the desire to become rich, you're out of the will of God. However, if the Lord leads you into a business endeavor, which you can accumulate great wealth, it is intended for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Not necessarily that you would give every dime to a church. That's not what I'm talking about. But everything we have in this life, whether it's wealth, whether it's influence, whether it's friends, whether it's family, whatever we have in this life, wherever we have circles of influence, those circles of influence are intended for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, for the building of his kingdom. So inasmuch as wealth acquisition by itself becomes the goal of our lives, it's a trap that leads to ruin and destruction. Money is not the problem, but the attitude toward money. Paul writes in verse 10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Uh, The King James Version says, the love of money is the root of all evil. The active word or the, the relevant word being the love of money. Not just money is the root of evil. Money is benign. The love of money is a problem. And it drives people to all kinds of evil behavior. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so this um, desire for money, I've seen it in my own life many times. People change um, personalities. They change their uh, behavior. They change their attitude towards this or that because of the love of money and the pursuit of money. Doesn't happen to everyone, but money seems to bring things to the surface in a way that other things do not bring to the surface in our lives. And so notice how people behave around money, how they um, follow through with their obligations, where their desires are, where their hearts are, where their passion is concerning money. And you will determine that what Paul has written is correct. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Paul continues to write to Timothy and by extension to you and I, But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Those are the things that the man and woman of God are to live for. Fight the good fight of faith, Paul writes. Take hold of eternal life, to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the sight of God who gives life to everything. And so Paul charges us to be like Jesus, to remain faithful uh, with endurance and gentleness, godliness, faith, and love being the hallmarks of who we are in Christ. And once again, he extends a, a further warning to the rich. Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth. Let me just look at that for a moment. Are those who are rich in this present world sometimes arrogant? I think the answer to that is widely known. Yes, many rich people are arrogant, and many of them think it is because of their own worth or merit or birthright or whatever, that they're special and they have a right to be arrogant. Paul writes that the rich in this present world are not to be arrogant. In another place, it's written that many who are first will be last in the world to come, and many who are last now will be first in the world to come. You see, friends, in this world, the rich are certainly first in many areas of life. But Paul says we're not to be arrogant. Those of us who are rich, we're not to be arrogant or put our hope in wealth. But we're to put our hope in God, who richly provides for us everything we need for our enjoyment in this life. Paul says we should command the rich to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And I think that's very godly counsel. Finally, wealth is not the meaning of life, friends. 
I think you know that, but I'm just stating the obvious. Paul writes in verse 19, In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. In what way? In being generous and and rich in good deeds. This is how they make themselves a firm foundation for the age to come. And so the life that is to come is all about what we did for Jesus Christ. You see, friends, the Lord is not going to have you arrive in heaven and congratulate you on the size of your IRA or your 401k or your your bank account or your investments. You're not going to hear that on the other side of the grave. You may hear, well done, good and faithful servant, but it's only having to do with those things that related to the kingdom of God. Yes, we're to be ethical, honorable people, and it is not a sin to have money. But it is a sin for money to have control of you and for wealth to be the thing that you live for. It can become an idol in our lives. And I think most of you know we live in a country where money is many people's idols. One last thing. The United States poverty level is far above the poverty levels of most of other countries. I travel in many countries where our poor would be in the top 1% or 2% of the wealthy in those countries. In fact, on a global basis, our poor would be in the top 2% of the world. Most of our poor would be in the top 2% of the world. And so this idea of the one percenters being vilified or the two percenters or whatever depends on your perspective. From the perspective of most of the world, the poor of America are the lucky ones. And so Paul extends a warning to the rich of this world, whoever they may be, And it may be you, friends, even though you don't consider yourself rich. Lord, I pray that all of us would be rich in the things of God and not in the things of this world. Lord, for those to whom you have entrusted great wealth, may it be used for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to avoid the love of money, which Paul writes is the root of all evil. Lord, we want to be known for the love of Christ and the love of our fellow man, not for how we loved money. Help us with this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Whole Word. It was brought to you by Whole Word Fellowship and the Northern Virginia House of Prayer. If you were encouraged, please share our podcast with your friends. We'd also appreciate it if you'd hit subscribe in your favorite podcast app and take a few moments to write a review. If you'd like more information on our church and our ministry, you can go to wholeword.net or wholewordpodcast.com for more information. Thank you again, and may the Lord Jesus bless you today and always.